Hey guys, I am posting the newest YouTube video, which is a real pod podcast with Victoria Garrick and me. And we discuss everything from mindset to body image to professional volleyball. Um, but I realized I didn't make an intro, so I'm doing that now. And we'll get right into the podcast. The quality is a little blurry, but it was on a Zoom call. So you can just put it on as background noise if you want to check it out. Well, I'm so excited to be talking to you. You are obviously currently one of the greatest players in the world, and I obviously know who you are, and I, I've followed you for a while, so it's a huge honor, and I guess I just want to know how you're doing. I mean, this is a completely different day-to-day -day life than you're used to living, so how have you been adjusting? It's been difficult, to be honest. I think you are playing overseas, you're training whether it's like four to six hours a day and you're like constantly active. And then when I got the news of the postponement for my league and came home in like two or three days of that, and I had like a whole week and I just didn't even know what to do. I've never like in my life, I have never not had a schedule for athletics and wow. like, it's really hard mentally to like not kind of go crazy. But as soon as I started working out and like, kind of making a schedule and stuff like that things have gotten a lot better at least like mentally having that like clarity and then having something to work towards and stuff but yeah when you came home did it fully sink in I mean you said within two to three days you're on a flight were you fully digesting the fact that this was happening or were you like this feels like a weird dream <laughs> it definitely felt like I had no idea what was going on because in Turkey there wasn't a lot of knowledge of what was happening. And I think, um, at least in the rest of the world, I think they were just focused on their country and it hadn't hit them yet and those kind of things. And obviously having ties in America, I'm hearing from, you know, my fiance, my family, like, hey, it's bad, like those kind of things. And so um, the minute they postponed the league, I was like, okay, I'll wait a little bit and then get on a flight and go home, kind of like pack up my stuff. And then the travel bans went into place and I didn't want to risk like getting stuck in Turkey. Right. And then I had to get, they were canceling flights like every day. And then I had to get my cat home and stuff. So like those 48 hours were like incredibly stressful, just trying to figure out what's going on. And, and then I get here and everyone's in masks and the streets are empty. And I'm just like, this is not my home. It's so strange. But <laughs> Especially where you live by the beach. You're used to so many people out all the time. Yeah. And now they're like cracking down hard on people at the beach or like surfing. So it's, it's been really, really empty here. Did you have any sort of emotional like moments where for you, from your perspective, we're nearing the time where all of your hard work sort of comes to a head. Like we're getting an Olympic roster that's on the radar. Like it's Tokyo 2020 is literally, we could smell it. And now that's being interfered with. And now we know it's being postponed, but did you have any feelings of, I don't know, anger, sadness, like, because this is so out of your control and yet you've done so much in your control to just be in this position yeah I definitely was sad I don't think I was too angry because I thought they would cancel the Olympics so there was actually a lot of relief and gratitude that they decided like hey we're gonna go on with this and we don't know the date but we're we're gonna keep going and so um for me I was really grateful for that decision but yeah it was ultimately really sad just because you do build up to that moment and you do like you go through a lot of stress to make that roster a lot of people don't know that the roster for the olympics is like made two to three weeks before the olympics and it's cut down from 14 to 12. um so everyone's on the chopping block and there is a lot of stress it's like okay once i get to the olympics and i can do that then i can like breathe again kind of thing and now you're like okay <laughs> so i'll have to like put that on pause for a little bit and just try to maintain. Right. I've heard about that from my friends who've been with USA or who've played at that level and how they say, you know, it literally the weeks before you guys find out. So it's even like some people are left wondering, you know, was, was this going to be my one Olympic experience? Was this going to be that time? And you're fortunate enough to have experienced that. Um, and so this would have been your second time around, but cannot even imagine. So how have you been adjusting to this new norm where you wake up and you don't have to go play volleyball and you don't have to pass and you don't have to be coached? It's definitely strange. Um, I started, so our team is doing Zoom workouts, the USA team. So we have to check in like twice a week and have the trainers watch us. I set up like a home gym downstairs and 
I think ultimately if I can get in the best shape and like stay strong, that'll help a lot. And then I d I've been really lucky because while performing and like while doing my career, I also have this creative side to me and I kind of don't want to be just a volleyball player. I want to have all the things that I love to do really balance me out. And so this time has been really fun to just like really dive into that creative world and uh, make videos, you know, take film photos and like do the things I love. So that adjustment has been a nice thing and an easy way to get through it without going crazy. And yeah, and we were talking just before we started recording about how you're a gifted videographer and photography. And I can even tell just with your social media how everything flows beautifully. <laughs> the colors, it's all, it looks great. Um, and it's something that when you're a high level athlete, you have to sacrifice some of these things that you love doing and you can't do them all the time. And I'm sure you've experienced so much sacrifice. And yeah. I would just love to hear about some of those big sacrifices you've had to make to become the volleyball player you are because so many people want to, oh, I want to be like Kelsey Robinson. I want to play for USA, but they don't understand how much you give up to be as good as you are. Yeah. I think um, when you make it to this level, you kind of have to make a choice of, you know, what you actually want. Like, what do you want with your career? What do you want to do with your life? And um, cause it's not easy to go play pro for eight months of the year and then come back to California, which I'm from Chicago. So my family's in Chicago still, so I'm still gone. I meant and to then, tell you my grandma's from Park Ridge. Oh yeah. <laughs> so literally so close to you. Um, yeah. and I was stalking your Wikipedia. I was like, oh my gosh, Chicago. <laughs> We're so close. That's awesome. <laughs> but um, sorry. Yeah. So when you come back. Yeah. So, I mean, you spend... I mean, the last seven, six, seven years, I've spent a, a lot of time away from my family and friends and the people I love. And um, it's hard because like, as you leave college, you have all these friends and like you have a life and then you, every year you kind of lose more and more of that. And um, I spent a lot of time fighting that. Like I wanted to have both worlds. And now I'm at the point where like, I'm fully in professional volleyball. I love where I live. I love my teammates. I love my life that I have. And it's a different life. Like, it's not the way we grew up in America with this, like, okay, you go to school, you get a job, like, you have a community, you stay with your family, like, those kind of things, and it's just a different life, and that stuff will start later for me, so I think that sacrifice has been really difficult, but ultimately, I think I've, like, grown in that and understood, like, what it takes. Right. It's, here. it's interesting you say, I'm finally at a point. Can you tell me about the first season you went abroad to play professionally? Because you are, like you said, being uprooted from the normal lifestyle most of your friends are going to live to now have a culture shock. The food's not the same. The language is different. The coaching is different. The volleyball is different. Um, and you could probably feel pretty alone in that. I mean, that's one of the big reasons that I think a lot of girls don't want to go pro is unfortunately, you know, we can't do that yeah. in America. Yeah. Um, well, my first year was in China. <laughs> so started off with a bang. Um, <laughs> China is a really difficult place to play. Um, you train a lot and you just don't have a lot of comforts from home or um, it's a very, very different experience than anything. Like it's not like Europe is pretty similar kind of to America and stuff, but China is just like a whole different ball game. Um, but it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise that it was my first season because I had no expectations. And I was like, I don't even know what professional volleyball looks like. So I'm here to play and put my head down and work and train and get better. And so um, that was kind of my mindset going into that. And it's a shorter season. So like four or five months. Did, um, did you have a roommate? I did not. I was one of two foreigners, but she lived in a, another hotel and she was from Turkey. Wow. How did you keep yourself like entertained? Did most of them speak some English or? There was like two or three that spoke enough English. And then the Turkish girl, her husband um, is a trainer. So he would train us too. So I'd have like some English to speak with him. He spoke really good English. Um, and then there was a men's player uh, from America that was on the men's team. Um, so I had like different outlets and stuff, but I feel like coming from a sports performance background and like Chicago and stuff, I'm just like, I can work and like put my head down. And I think not a lot of people can do that, especially that's why I think people are more afraid to go to like such different experiences like the Asia countries because it's just a whole different level but yeah it was it was a good experience I got a ton of reps and going from college to pro the ball is different the game is different and so getting that 
early repetition and working through the ball and stuff like that, that really helped me to get to the next level with my career. I can tell by the way you talk about volleyball, your mindset is obviously very unique. And I actually watched an interview of you where I think the interviewer said, you know, do you prefer playing libero or outside? And your answer was whatever I'm asked to play, I'll play. And to have a response like that and have a mindset like that, which, you know, does look to gratitude and look to opportunity. Have you always had that? You know, I can imagine most people will get to China and they don't want to put their head down and work. They're like, I want to call my parents. Why am I here? This isn't what I thought it would be. How did that develop for you? Well, I do want to say that I don't, it's not that I don't always have those breakdowns because I have called my parents a number of times saying like, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've just had a really great support system and um, my family kind of raised me with just a really strong backbone and work effort. Like that was kind of um, how they pushed me and stuff in sports. And I think the gratitude, like in order to cope with what you're doing and being alone and all those things, like you have to reach for that. Like you have to reach for the joys, the gratitude, little, little things that wake you up in the morning and make you do it. Um, yeah. And I just have set a lot of goals for myself. I think by setting those goals, like that was like, why I wanted to wake up and do what I'm doing because I want to achieve this. I want to be an Olympian and I don't want to just, you know, win this. I want to win the Turkish league. I want to win champions league. Like there's so many goals out there. And I think that's kind of what has pushed me and like excelled my career. When did you first have Olympic hopes and goals? Yeah. Um, like I was saying, I think, you know, every little girl, I'm sure you did too. Like you watch the Olympics and you think like, I would love to do that. Like, I really want to do that. You would think that, but my goal was straight up just like D1. I had nothing after that. I'm like, that's where I'm peaking. That's where I'm going. After that, I don't need to play again. And so it's funny when people ask me that. I'm like, no, I didn't. I think it was like the oddball. Yeah, but I mean, at least you like, you knew it. You're like, I'm going to get there and then I'm going to go do what I want. That's <laughs> true. Um, yeah, I think like, as a little girl, I always wanted that, like to be an Olympian, whether it was basketball or volleyball or whatever that meant, but you just don't really think that it's real kind of thing. You think that's, oh, that can't be me. Like I'm not good enough. Um, and so when I got out of, when I graduated from Nebraska and got a chance to train with the national team and actually it was the summer before my senior year, I went out as a libero and Karch had asked me to stay and I had to go back to finish school, so I couldn't stay. Um, so that was like my first taste of like, oh, this is real now, you know, like I really do have a chance. And then when I went out to the national team and that summer we won club world champion, or not club, uh, world championships, we got our first gold. Um, I was like, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm hooked. I, I think I can do this. I think I could be an Olympian. And um, it was kind of always just like one step at a time like just going wherever it took me and really just feeling like lucky that I was there. It's refreshing to hear you say that, you know, you had those thoughts of I'm not good enough because it is this huge feat of, okay, I like, I want to be the best in the world. And that's one of those things that for even people who are good enough or in pursuit to say out loud can come across like, you know, you have to have this mindset of that's possible for me. Um, did you struggle with that confidence, like maybe your first year on the team, like looking at those girls you looked up to and wearing the red, white, and blue and questioning, you know, why am I here? Yeah. I think I always was like, I don't really get it. <laughs> like, how am I good enough to be here kind of thing? Um, and I still feel that way a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times it's just like this feeling of not being good enough and um, having things happen to you professionally in your career and like those thoughts stick with you a lot. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is just like working through it mentally all the time and knowing that it will never really go away. Like you'll still have a little bit of that. Um, obviously it's much less than what I dealt with in the beginning, but I still feel those thoughts a lot, especially with mistakes and like stupid things, you know? Yeah. I'm wondering what specifically like triggers those thoughts like currently stats or who's playing or how, how do those come in so for the national team there's about eight to ten outsides and four go three went to the olympics and so you're really like vying for a spot like everything counts and i think like that's a hard like 
that's a hard way to practice, you know, everything you do, every like touch on the ball, it's all statted out. It's all um, analyzed and not only in practices, but the games and the games you win and how you play and how you perform. And so, yeah, that like kind of creeps in and kind of gets to you a little bit like, shoot, I messed up or I got pulled in this match and I'm not good enough. And then now I'm thinking about what the coaches are thinking and like, what are they going to, am I going to make it or am I going to be on this roster? I've been having a garbage month in practice or things like that. You know, you just like spin the circles all the time. And I think for me, I've never really been like the stat player. Like I don't feel like my value to a team is based off of my stats. Like I'm a really great passer. I know that, but like the rest of it, I would say like, I'm good. But I think the one thing that is not doubted is just like the energy I bring. The um, intangibles. Yeah. And I've always like really relied on that, whether it's been national team or my club teams. And something I like pride myself on is like every team I've been on has asked to hire me back. And so that's like a really great reminder that, you know, this isn't what, it wasn't because of the stats. It was because of what I bring as a teammate and what I give to that team. I, I totally agree with you. And I think people overlook the importance of that. And that also contributes, I think, to playing well, because you're focusing on others and how you can give to your teammates and how you can contribute to like a bigger picture. And that's better in the long run than someone that is here just to buff their stats and doesn't care about how anyone else plays. Yeah. And I think to go along that professional volleyball is so much different in the fact that you have six subs and there's not a you can't be good at one thing, you know, like to make it like you can be a great attacker, but you have to have the other skills and you have to be a great teammate or you just won't have a long career. And I love that you brought up how you are a great passer, because when you switched to libero, I remember I was following the team during this um, and I was not familiar with the fact that you had initially joined the team as a libero. So what was the mindset switch like? Because obviously as an outside, you have the opportunity to like pass a one and then go put the ball away. My bad guys, but we got the point. As a libero, like your sole responsibility is put up a good pass. Um, yeah. So how did you deal with that, that shift and that new position you were playing? The first time I started off in that position, I never had any training with it. Like we switched me to libero in the middle of a tournament. So I just like had to figure it out fast. And I think, you know, I accepted the challenge, but I think I wanted to be perfect too much. Um, I was actually getting aced quite a bit more than I ever have in my career. So that was a little bit more challenging, but I think it was because I was trying to be perfect. Like I have these two jobs, pass, play defense. And right. so like be perfect at that. And when we came back from that tournament, um, that like training block going up into world championships, I kind of, I watched my passing and kind of worked through it and stuff and realized like all I have to be is good. Like my good is really good at this job. So I just have to be good. And like that put that's like stress and tension on myself to give a set or a perfect pass and ended up bringing my, um, taking out my, a lot of the aces that I was getting and kind of pushing my passing back to where it used to be. I totally can relate to how you had that dialogue of, okay, now I have to like be perfect and pass and play D well because I'm libero. And I think when we talk to ourselves as athletes about like what we should be doing in our role, that's where we like go totally crazy. And we have all these anxious thoughts as opposed to when you're not even thinking about your passing, you know, you're passing nails. Yeah. Um, so how did you, from that point on, like use what you'd learned in that situation to parlay into the rest of your game? I think it's just that reminder that like what makes you successful is like giving when I make it about everyone else, my game elevates. Like when I'm thinking about how I help the setter get everybody in system or how I cover my attackers or how I make eye contact and a handhold or like those kind of things, I don't even worry about my game and my game just turns into like flow state. Yeah. A hundred percent. You move the spotlight off yourself and you focus on others. Yeah. Um, in terms of your confidence, where do you pull that from? A lot of it is, you know, when I'm playing the game, like when I'm in the zone and like when I'm playing to win in a high level match and, you know, the whole stadium is sold out and it's, it's like what you want to be doing as an athlete playing in those moments, like 23, 24. And like that 
is just all confidence for me because it's like I'm exactly where I want to be and all I can think about is this point like I can't even think about anything else and so you're just like so confident in the fact that like I'm gonna put this ball away and I'm gonna you know help our team win and like those kind of things and I, I think it just comes naturally um, while I'm playing. I saw in one of your videos about um, getting in the game state mindset you did actually mention sometimes you had experienced like such nerves that your physically your stomach got sick um that interests me and then you said you were able to actually like turn that into your best game so how long did you sort of deal with that nervousness and like the the stomach aching um before games and then kind of learn to grow with it yeah so that is still with me up until this day um but the difference is is like probably up until after the Olympics and I had that feeling and I would just try to fight it. Like, I don't want, I'm sitting in an Olympic game. I don't want to feel nervous. You know, I, I want to be free. And I think the younger me was like, okay, those thoughts can't exist. Like let them go. And like, then I'd get tighter, more butterflies. And within the last like two or three years, I think I've just learned to accept the butterflies and like tell myself like, that's my body preparing for battle. Like if I don't have those butterflies or if I don't feel like fantastic, I'm going to have a great match. And it usually was the case because my body was ready. It was just me like getting in the zone and getting ready for these big matches. I feel like now when I'm, if I take a nap before the game and it's a big game and I don't feel anything, I'm like, come on, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> I'm <butterfly>. understimulated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How have you grown with your mindset? You seem like you obviously think about things with great perspective and you have really good self-awareness obviously that comes with experience but have you had any mentors or or do you meditate or do you practice mindfulness did anything come into your life to help you focus on the mental side of your sport yeah I think we've had a lot of great people work with our teams in the past like Mike Gervais he was amazing at that um, and just kind of helping me with like the flow state and those kind of things um, I've played for some really great coaches, Giovanni Guidetti, he's the coach of Vakitbank and the Turkish national team. And he is like, I don't know, he just takes you and like, he breaks you down in practice and like breaks you down in like hard moments. And then right when you need it, he pushes you and he's like, you're, I don't know, he just gave me so much confidence. Like as a player, I, ne I didn't have that much confidence until playing for him. Really? And it was like, I am one of the best in the world. Like. He made me believe that. I'm interested. Can you give me an example? Like, were you digging? Was this like a, a hitting drill? What exactly happened? Well, we just, at Bucket Bunk, we would train really, really hard, like three to four hours or sometimes six, like in a day. And so you'd be exhausted and the drills were really, really hard to win. Um, and you're playing with some of the best in the world, Juting, um, Milena Rosic, Lenny Slotis, like really the, the best. And so... <laughs> you fail a lot. Like, I think everybody, like one person to practice would cry for the entire year. Like somebody else took turns. Um, but you fail often and he would kind of teach you like, okay, minus five for your team if you get blocked, but zero if you hit it out. Like trying to hit high, hit the hands, those kind of things. And it was just this like mindset shift of like what I should be going for as an attacker. Um, and then before the games, like if it's a really big moment, he just like pumps you up so good. And like, even if you make a mistake, he'll like grab you and be like, I need you, you know, like keep going. And like those kind of moments were really big for me in the fact that not only am I playing for one of the best teams in the world, but like I have the trust of one of the best coaches in the world. And that reality really, really kind of skyrocketed my belief in myself. Seems like they were putting you in just uncomfortable situations every day in practice. Yeah. And putting you in the trenches and then let's function here. Let's be good in the trenches because then when we play a game, it's going to be feel so light and so easy. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Wow. Um, what has been the biggest difference between the player you are now with maybe the college player you used to be? Yeah. I mean, so much has changed um, since I was in college, but I think a lot of it has stuck with me, but I just think, Obviously, my skill set is higher, and I've been playing at a faster, stronger level for a long time. Um, but I think that, like, that girl who loves the game with all the energy and the confidence and, like, just wants to play, like, that has always stayed with me um, from college. But 
Yeah, it's just such a totally different game. It's like really, really hard to relate to. Have you ever had a season though or a year where you're just like, ah, oh, volleyball today? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I that is a lot of it. I'm not like, I love volleyball like every single day. Um, that would be a lie. <laughs> um, there are days where you're just like, I miss home. What am I doing this for? You know, like, is it worth it kind of thing? But I think... Um, my first year at Bucket Bunk, I didn't actually play. So I went with the intention of being uh, the outside hitter for Champions League. But so there's only four foreigners or three foreigners allowed in Turkish League. And the foreigner playing or the, the girl playing in front of me was a Turkish player. This was her last season. She was really famous um, and she was really, really talented. So I sat that whole year pretty much behind her. And I remember like my third month into that season because I'm here to play. Like I'm here overseas living in another country for eight months to play and I'm not. And I just sat in the car, in the car on the way home and like sobbed. Like I just was like, like that deep, you can't right. breathe. Um, sobbing. Yeah. So I was like, what am I even here for? Like this is I just, like all the swears in the world. And like, I can't do this anymore. I want to go home. I want to be done. I want to move on. Like my career, I want it like done. And yeah. that was like, the breaking point for me, I think. I had went through a lot of stuff before that to get to that point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And then I just kind of like slept on it and got, we had a few days off and stuff like that. And then I just decided I wasn't gonna let it like take my power, you know? Like I love this game. And if I'm here, I'm gonna get better. Like I'm here, I'm gonna learn from her. I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna push the other side to win. And our team actually won. Um, every cup that year, every cup possible to win, we won. So it was a really great year. And then I got asked to go back. Wow, that's awesome. What are the biggest ways you, you made yourself valuable to the team as someone who wasn't contributing on the court? Yeah, that's tough because, I mean, not only that year was I not playing, but with the national team, the first Olympics, I was always the third outside. Um, but I had major respect for the people that were in front of me. Um, so my mindset was like, look, I'm young in pro volleyball, technically, like I'm young here, I'm here to learn. So I just tried to soak it all in. I tried to learn from Jordan and Kim and obviously like I want to be out there. That would be a lie to say that I didn't. Um, but my, like the only thing I would tell myself is I'm going to make them better. Like I'm going to score every single point on the B side so that they get better so that they win. Um, and you just try to find like little victories on like how you can push and how you can get better and how you can give your give to your team because I think the last thing you want to be doing is like being a negative and like taking because then the ultimate goal is, isn't winning. Having gone through that experience, <laughs> what sort of standard do you hold yourself to now as someone who is that starter? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I just try to make sure that I'm still doing the same things, you know. Um, giving and now I'm entering more of a leadership role with the national team which is kind of the first time because I was always one of the younger players and so that's really difficult to think like oh people value my voice you know people are looking at me now because um, that's really never been the case so yeah I'm trying to like figure that out and navigate that and transition just because I don't always believe in myself to be that person um, but yeah just trying to work hard and make connections with people and communicate and like do the same things I've always done. What do you think the best qualities are for a leader? I would say authenticity. I, really? That's an interesting one. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I just think like I lead in a different way than Jordan Larson leads, you know, than Micah Hancock. Everybody has their own style. Everybody has their own way of playing or being and you can't have too many people of the same thing. Like it would just be too much. And so for me, like I lead on the court with my energy and the way I play and my confidence and like my connection to the girls, like that's just me. That's natural. That's who I am. Um, the off the court things like organization and stuff like that, I'm not going to be able to do it probably. <laughs> um, it's just never been my forte with that stuff. But yeah, I think just being authentic because people want to follow you. People want to look to you when, they know that, like that's 100% who you are. Since that experience where you had the heart cry, like I might quit and then you didn't, have you had anything close to that? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Again. <All the> <laughs> really i mean you just you're playing we don't a lot of people don't know like pro volleyball players we don't have an off season so a lot of those tears and a lot of that like comes from separation of being at home and stuff like that um but yeah i mean it's hard it's hard to be a pro volleyball player and it's hard to be at the top level and have those expectations like this is your job you can have fun but you got to win like that's it and so there's so much pressure that goes into that. And I think like sometimes it does get to you. It gets to me for sure. Um, but it, you just have to remind yourself and bring yourself back to the reason like why you're doing it. And for you, that why is to win gold at the Olympics? I think the why for me is because I love it. Like I really love volleyball. And people who know me will say, like, I'll be like, yeah, I'm retiring after this one for sure. And they'll be like, <laughs> you're going to be playing till you're 40, which I feel like is probably true. <laughs> um, yeah, the why is, I just love competing. I love it so much. It's like where everything makes sense. Right. It's just such a advanced way to approach your everyday life and like sort of, I love this term of like face yourself from within. I mean, one of the things I miss most about the game is, yeah, I'm not pushed to that level mentally every day. Like it's not as stimulating because it's so stimulating to be uncomfortable and on the verge of tears, but then you have to finish the game. Um, yeah. those are moments where like you can really go to bed and feel like super accomplished and like you really grew in that moment. But right now it's weird because you're finally, what, whatever those fantasies were of like, <laughs> I just have nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, like you have that right now. Has that affected the way you've now reflected on like your season? Where you're like, oh, I would kill to be back in Turkey right now because I'm oh, so yeah. bored. <laughs> For sure. I think after the first week I was like, well, I would like to be playing volleyball right now. <laughs> um, especially like in March, you're kind of at that like grind time where you've been there a while now, the games are getting harder and it's just like, okay, I'm exhausted. But yeah, now I would love to be there. But I think like you said, like the one thing I relate to that was just, it's worthy to pursue something. I think like when I'm doing nothing or whatever that life looks like besides volleyball, I think I will have a hard time. I think anyone would in the transition just because like you are pursuing something, whether you fail or like whether you succeed, it's the process is why it's the purpose of it. You know, the, that's what keeps me going. Something you said in the very beginning of this podcast was that you want to be more than a volleyball player. And then you just mentioned purpose. So how do you not tie your purpose solely to volleyball? So many people struggle with that. And I'm curious to know. I think I've like really pursued balance. And I think for a long time, it was like Kelsey, the volleyball player. And I think after the Olympics, the first one, I was like, I don't know who I am <laughs> after this. Um, just because you get to, you know, you get to the peak of your career and like the pinnacle of sport and you do it and you accomplish it, accomplish it and then you're like, okay, like what next kind of feeling? I still cry. I still have bad days. <laughs> I'm still upset. Yeah. I I was happy forever. <laughs> For sure. And that was me like a hundred percent. I was like, once I can call myself an Olympian, I'll be happy. Like there's nothing more. Like I'll be a happy person, which is obviously dumb <laughs> to even like think like that. Um, but I put so much weight into achieving that goal that I really didn't know how to operate after it. Um, and it took, it took a long time. Like I took time to figure out like what volleyball meant to me and you know, what I wanted to do next. And I kind of realized it was just like, like I said, it was the, the reason why I was doing that was not to be something. It was to pursue that and to like be a part of the process of that. Like that was what was worth it. Going to the Olympics, of course, hundred percent loved that experience. And it will be something that stays with me for the rest of my life. But I think the moments that led up to that and during it and how much you connected with your teammates and the hard days and the good days, like that was the whole point of it. And so now you're sort of letting go of purpose be one thing, but more so just how Kelsey's like experiencing her every day. Yeah. For, it's so much every day for me. Like, I don't want to look back and be like, I spent eight years playing pro and the whole time I was wishing I was coming home, you know, like, yeah it's so much day to day and just like soaking it all in. Cause you just don't know when it's going to be over. And like, also like with everything going on right now, like that is just such a reminder, like you don't know what it's going to be taken from you and you should try to take advantage of like being in those moments. 
Wow, it's been so cool to hear about your story and all your philosophies. And something I'm really pumped to talk to you about is body image. And I know that you said that this is something that you've struggled with your whole life. And that's you, that's cool for me to hear because I think, and you probably know this yourself, but you do get a lot of um, comments and recognition for fans think you're so beautiful. And I know that can be something that is like, we all have our own things that we think about ourselves. Then to have people telling you things about your appearance and how you look, not to mention volleyball uniforms can just add like a lot of pressure. So when did you first sort of have a, a bit of a struggle with image? I think a lot of it started when I was young. Um, kind of just like searching for value, for like searching to give value, um, to feel valued. And a lot of that came from winning, obviously. I was like, oh, people recognize me. People want me in their life if, I, if I'm winning. Um, and then I was a very socially awkward kid um, growing up and stuff. And so I would put a lot of my of pressure on myself to like be a certain way, look a certain way, play a certain way, you know? and be recognized and then, oh, now I'm giving value because I, I have all these things, you know? And then obviously with volleyball, you wear like tiny uniforms and stuff like that. And, and then you move to California where they're like, everything is just even where heightened. Everyone is a model. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think it was something that just kind of stuck with me, stuck with me, stuck, stuck with me the rest of my life. And it's still a struggle to this day, but it was just kind of something that happened, I think, when I was younger that, you know, just took space and made me feel like, oh, if I look a certain way, like I'll bring something to the table or like I'll add value or somebody will, you know, want me instead of like for who I am, they'll want me because I'm a certain way. When did you get, gain this awareness that that's sort of what you were working towards? I think to be honest, like my fiance, which sounds like silly a man makes you feel like you're beautiful but like he really makes me feel like the most beautiful human in the world and like none of it is for my looks like mm -hmm. he loves me for my mind and you know my ability to be a volleyball player and like to pursue other things and he's just constantly encouraging me you know like encouraging me to pursue the things I want to pursue and then also like reminding me I'm beautiful yeah, and I think it's okay to have someone show us the way we should love ourselves, whether it's a fiance or it's a mom or it's a best friend. Um, you know, I can relate to those moments where you first start like falling in love with someone and then you feel like you look terrible and you're heavy and you're bloated and you're gross and you're hairy. And they're like, I love you. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> you can love me like this. Um, and then day by day, you just hold yourself to less of a strict standard. For sure. And we... It's actually funny. We met in Italy and we were both 20 pounds heavier because we had just been like first year in Italy, carbonara, pizza, all these things. So I was like real round in the face. <laughs> um, but yeah, so obviously that's nice when they meet you a little bit heavier. But I think obviously like he has made me feel beautiful. But I think the best part of that journey with him is like now I'm like, I really truly feel beautiful, like with however I am or you know, in a swimsuit or these kind of things, like he's just like made me feel that. And I've kind of grown in that. That's awesome. Um, what are, what are some of the current ways you maintain like a healthy relationship with your image? Yeah, I think a lot of it was food for me first. Like that was the biggest thing I would count calories or I would restrict. And also you have to perform at the same time, you know, right. you have to be strong. Like a volleyball player has to be strong and physically and then you're getting a lot of those comments like you're beautiful you're this you're that if you look a certain way and like I don't know I your think coach is telling you how to look these people are telling you how to look you're telling yourself how to look yeah it's like all encompassing and it's like it was on my mind every day like counting calories every single day um and then I think a lot of it was the first start to everything was living a healthier lifestyle with my like relationship to food um, because I would binge and, you know, and then eat nothing and then binge and then eat nothing. I know, girl, been there. <laughs> You're preaching. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like such a toxic, yeah. like, you can't even like function as a human because you can't go out to eat with friends without like making sure the menu's okay or like mm -hmm. I can do this or how many drinks can I actually have? 
how long did I work out? And like, that's going through your head every single day. Um, so my first, like, I think I was, was like 25 and I was like, I'm done with this. I'm done with it. I want to live normally. I want to not let food control my life. What was your breaking point? Like a night of just, <laughs> this is, I've had enough. Did, did yeah. something happen or? Well, it was just with vodka, it was so many long training hours and like you have to sustain and you have to be strong. And I wasn't allowing myself to do those things with the way that I was eating. And so I just wanted to like let go and like see where I could be uh, with my game and stuff. And then I kind of got to the point of like learning, you know, I can have a piece of chocolate or I can have a glass of wine or I can have dessert with my friends, but like the rest of my life is eating healthy. And now I like literally never look at pasta or like, I'm like scared or I don't want that. I'm like, yes, another dessert, please. <laughs> so that's been like a really great part of the journey for me. Isn't it really like heartwarming for yourself to look back on how you used to think and then think about how you are now and just feel like there's so much possibility. And it makes me think of all the other people who are still struggling with food and can't envision. Like I remember thinking, oh, there's like the pasta. There's no way I see pasta and I don't freak out about if it's a cup or if it's three cups. Um, and now, you know, not, I don't have those thoughts. So what would your advice be for someone who's resonating with these, who's resonating with our conversation and is thinking about how to take that next step to think about how they can have a better relationship with food? Yeah, I would say like, okay, this is kind of what I did, but like start with everything in moderation. Like you can't be afraid of food and what it will do to you. Like food is your source of energy. Like you need it. Right. And then what I started doing was if I wanted dessert, I'd have it in the middle of the day, like at lunch, because I knew I was going to train and I would be able to like train it off kind of thing. And then that allowed me to see like, Hey, I can eat this and it can be okay. And nothing will change. That, that allowed you to sort of gain your intuition back and decide what you yeah. were hungry for and what you wanted. And then you're, I think a big thing you talk about as well on your social media platforms is like how you feel and how the food you eat makes you feel as opposed to how the food you eat makes you look. And yeah. that's, I think the biggest shift is, yeah, it is fuel for my performance to be an elite volleyball player, not something that is for how I appear in a picture. Yeah. And I like, I have these, um, my fiance, Brian, he can eat whatever he wants and like be a muscly, like, all guys all like yeah, it's, it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> but he'll always be like hey we're gonna eat healthier like you're not like we're not gonna have cookies or stuff in the house and I'm like look if I deny myself those things like I'll go right to binging the next time I see it so like from our style is totally different because like I eat healthy like 90% of the time but like I have to have that like outlet if I want it just to make everything Choice. yeah balanced I need Doritos in the pantry I might not eat them I might not touch them, but I just need them there because then I know like I could have it if I wanted it. But if someone said we're not having junk food in the house, that would be triggering for me. Despite all the work I've done, I just like similar to you need to have the choice. I totally yeah. relate. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Well, thank you for opening up about that because that's, that's really huge stuff. And, um, you know, it's cool for someone like me too, who looks up to you and all those girls to hear that you have the normal thoughts, just like me and everyone else. Um, it's refreshing, especially with just so many people kind of wanting to portray that they have everything together, but sometimes, you know, we're human and we don't, but we figure it out. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it's difficult, like social media and Instagram and my Instagram, I love photos. And so I love things looking nice and stuff, but it's a highlight reel, you know? Yeah. Like, everyone's that's why I like YouTube a lot because it's like this is who I really am and like it's super natural I love your Instagram though but I because I can respect the artistry like I think yours is crafted in genuinely art like you have pictures of curtains and tea and things that are actually like I could tell from your feed this is something that makes her really happy like the aesthetic of it as opposed to I think the feeds we're thinking of are people who like every picture is their body and it's photoshopped or it's them looking really good. Um, sure. You know, so I think I've also had to be able to appreciate like people can love photography and like love having a feed that way, but it's got to be the right reasons. And clearly yours is like, it brings you joy for that beautiful, yeah. like curtain picture. <laughs> I, I was like, I talked to your whole feed. I was like, I need to know everything about it before we do this. Um, that's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. You're just 
such a lovely human. I never use the word lovely, but I, I'm just <laughs> getting it from you. You're just so gentle and thoughtful. And um, yeah, I really had a great time chatting with you. So thank you so much. No, thank you. I, yeah, this was fun. I've been wanting to do it for a while. And obviously I have a lot of respect for you and what you've you know, done with your volleyball career and like made it into this huge platform. So um, that's really cool, not only for me to see, but I think for the volleyball community to see, because it hasn't happened and I don't see anyone else doing it. Thank you. It's crazy how many young volleyball players are out there that like want something like this. And I know your YouTube channel um, is really successful. And there's so, if you think about all the girls that play club, I mean, it's like, remember those club tournaments? Thousands and thousands of people. Thousands. I can't believe we don't have professional volleyball. I feel like it would. I think it's coming in the next few years, at least if they're going to give it a try, they're going to. Can they let me in when I'm 35? I'll be ready to go. And then by the time I'll be on my like last leg, like here we go. <laughs>